How you doing back there, Ram's Horn? <coughs> Been a while, fish keepers. I've had birthdays, storms, birthday storms. Check out this decade-old kissing grommy at my mother-in-law's house, living off of osmosis water and memories of her tank mate four years past. And uh, welcome to Mordor, right in my neighborhood. All right, this storm looked cooler in real life. There's a setting somewhere on this camera which would bring this out. Continuing. And we have another Brenton's Fish update. Why did I say it like that? Welcome to my halls of humidity. My intention is not to overlap any information, but if I do, forgive me. My memory can be as slippery as a guppy. There's a lot of tutorials I want to release in the future. There's a few videos I'm making at the same time. Blind spots, YouTube blind spots, meaning there's information even on the internet. It's just not available on YouTube yet. For now, I just wanted to log in, give you all a glimpse of some things that have changed and some things to think will change later down in the road. I found out from this comment that my mystery snails might be going hungry, which is why they're acting a little strange. I ran out and I got blood worms and I put them in and they instantly sprang to life. And they've been a lot more active since then. I put frog bit in this tank and it's like a double-edged sword. The snail is not gonna eat enough plants to sustain itself, but if you don't want it to eat the plants, it definitely will. They, they cannot get enough nutrients from the plants. I'm assuming they were starving when they were eating these plants. I put so much food in here, the, the tank started to stink a little bit and had to do a water change. And I've noticed all the little fuzzies on these frog bit roots are gone. They've had themselves quite the texture snack. You know, Father Fish is probably giving good advice when he's like, don't feed your fish, don't feed your fish. But there's a few species that I've run across. They will absolutely starve on you. I know an auto catfish will starve on you a lot of times. You want to school them, but they probably need a couple of hundred gallons to properly school in. Not because of the space, but because that's the volume of water you'd need for algae to naturally occur to keep those little auto bellies full. So you're going to have to add supplements or algae. And certainly these mystery snails, they want to be fed. They want a place at the dinner table. I've noticed when I get it right with mystery snails, it seems like they awake immediately. They seem lethargic when they're hungry. And right when I put blood worms in here, they started to just slowly come to life. And, and they started moving so fast that the little ram's horn snails couldn't even stay on their back. Oh, that was pretty funny. The diets of these mystery snails are a little more complicated than you might take at face value. There's a lot of vitamin needs. See, this guy has kind of had a split ever since he was little. Um, and then you can see the rough part when he started living with me. This is obviously a deficient somewhere. I found three recipes that I'm gonna try. These are the recommendations. And if I can get every single food from the grocery store into the bellies of these little snails, I'm sure clean, polished shells are just on the horizon for this fish tank. Right now, it's rapashi, algae wafers, blood worms, krill, and tums. I'm going to assume that their dietary needs are incomplete until I actually start seeing eggs. So that's the update for this tank. How you doing back there, ram's horn? <coughs> Substrate update alert. My dwarf lily started melting back, so I try to put it in a higher light tank. And so what's left in here is the Mexican oak leaf plant. When I first found out the common name for this plant, and then I looked closely, I was floored. They actually do kind of look like full-sized oak tree leaves, relatively. This oak leaf plant is native to the Texas-Mexican border. I added this brick-colored substrate right into the tank full of water a half a cup at a time and the shrimp are able to shuffle around it and stay out of the way and they jump on top of the new gravel kind of like the donkey at the bottom of the well i never rinse my substrate i don't see a point it already gets rinsed when it's in the water and then to place substrate in an established tank i scoop the gravel i slowly pour it underwater and all the little inhabitants look up and say the sky is falling i put the same substrate in my purple mosaic 10 gallon 
I put one cup at a time in this tank. Not super invasive. Some of the other tanks that I put the substrate in, I turned the entire tank upside down and I tried to shake out all the shrimp, but I'm sure there's little renegades somewhere. I was observing the microfauna in this tank and I saw a tiny little clear iridescent shrimp. And it was like the size of a water bear. It's wild I'm gonna to have to wait until the little sucker grows up so I can nab him and put him in the uh, coal tank. Something to keep in mind when you're got different types of shrimp and you're transporting plants. All right, here are the uh, purple red dragons. But this tank is dirty, dirty. Excuse me real quick. With wonder shell, everything is possible. Wonder shell, everything is possible. I'm waiting on my sponsorship, wonder shell. These purple red dragons were filmed in the last video and I spotted the dreaded white string poo. I think I actually took care of that by treating the regular food with Epsom salt. It's the first time I did it, and after the first 48 hours, I saw a change, but after the fifth day, they had no more kite strings. The Epsom salt, which is magnesium sulfate, not sodium chloride, it's more of the spa salt, and it sends shrieking shards of crystals through a fish that a parasite suffers the death of a thousand cuts from. This salt doubles as an antiseptic, healing all the inside boo-boos, and it's a preventative measure as much as a countermeasure. I'm gonna follow up with a medicine that has metronidazole. I will say I have treated with this, and I think this medicine is a little finicky, and it needs to be consumed within 10 seconds, refrigerated, a prayer set over it. To be fair, using this line has been more effective than mixing my own, just not as good as Epsom salt. I'm still seeing kite strings in my platies and I don't appreciate it one bit. So I'm definitely gonna follow this up with the other three medicine foods that I use from angelsplus.com. This tiger female grew an anchor worm. It's looking big and bulbous. For that achievement, the worm wins the big and bulbous award, copper and salt, he won't like it. A little endler instantly looks better. But I think I'm gonna keep her in here like a little Sarah Connor until we're sure she can stop talking about the rise of the Brotherhood of the Machines. These shrimp from Aquahuna are not breeding. I got four different strains and I think they all like to chill at the same time. I do tend to receive oldies from them and these guys just aren't budging. The eBay shrimp are breeding and we have a bunch of green jade everywhere. It's really easy to get into this thought process that the bigger the shrimp, the better. And there is a lot of wow factor to a large, old Neocaridina. However, I find that the smaller ones tend to have more babies. That if you have a lot of variation and you have a lot of small ones in your starter colony, well then clap your hands and stomp your feet because those hooks are going to sink in and the generations are going to roll out easier and with a lot less snags. This tank was a glass bottom last time as well. We had those mixed red and blues, and we got those out of there. I put the Japanese trapdoors in here. They're acting a lot more lively by themselves. I'm not sure if they don't like ram horns. It does make me want to conduct further observation. Could be my imagination. Maybe I just want to see snail drama. When I see these snails having a hard time, it seems like they're in the same spot for a few days, and they just seem sluggish and a precaution sometimes I'll just completely change their environment and I've done that twice already with some slight pH changes slight temperature changes aeration might be different but really the the neighbors are different as well it occurs to me that when they go into a new tank there's probably new algae available different types of algae so if they're looking sluggish new tank new reaction new food roll that dice I think what I'm mistaking as an environmental change is really just a food change in the tank. They get in there, they smell something else, they're at it. This wisteria is all of a sudden not having a good time. It's very strange how they rot at the roots. I have a few plants that do this. Some of them, they, they get real strong root systems into the gravel and then they just decide it's gross and they will uh, rot off and then just be floating plants for a little bit. This is my deformed tank. Whether these little guys are sick or deformed, I 
prefer to just let them live out their whole life right here in my fish room. I feel like it's my responsibility, particularly if they're born here, to go ahead and try to give them as a comfortable life as possible. And I realize in some cases, maybe euthanasia is unavoidable. I haven't seen that case myself. For me, I feel really guilty using a guppy with a Habsburg monarchy jaw and then turning around and making them pay for it. So just for a few pennies, for fractions of a penny to run a little deformed tank. Ultimately, my joy comes from taking care of fish and really whether those fish are profitable or not is kind of the, the second prime directive towards me just enjoying taking care of fish. Sick fish definitely fit that role. Uh, deformed fish, rather. Fish with deformities or birth defects. I just let them live their life. They don't really do breeding too hot in here. I keep it a little cold. And every hour on the hour, they go up to their little tower and uh, ring a bell for me. Let's play Who's That Endler? So we have these El Tigre Endlers, no tail tips, green, black, red. Then we have this guy. Is he a blue star? Is he a peacock? Is he a Santa Maria? I guess we will never know. What we do know is he has definitely bred and whatever strain he is, the whole tank is rolling with it now. Thus goes the flock into the realm of hybrids. Just like a few other accidents that I remember from the past. With genetic diversity comes healthier fish. I was looking at this tank a little closer. These are my blue star endlers. And you can tell that they aren't the mystery fish because the flag is on the underside of the tail. These refuse to stop rotting indoors. Really, it doesn't matter. The hyacinth has been hellions. It took me a while to realize there was aphids on them and that earned them a trip outdoors. The reason they earned the sleeper plant from hell award, it sheds like a dog. I found out that it sheds little crystals into your skin, not so much the aquatic versions, but they still don't recommend you touch it with your bare skin. And they brought me the gift of aphids right into my living room. Are these even aphids? Got a good gander at them up close and personal before I took a nap and I had fever nightmares, woke up thinking I imagined these, went back a second time just to get shocked all over again. I'm doing my part. As for the hyacinth, I might cut them up, I might cook them, I might eat them. I'm blown away that I got got. I always adopted that I didn't have to worry about any pests coming in on plants. People who sold plants said that plants did not come really with any pest if you didn't mind snails. Uh, don't take that at face value. Aphids bug me on another level. <laughs> That's way past being a snail apologist. I temporarily acquired a ladybug guard, hoping that she would take out some aphids. She kept flying into the light. I was thinking that she thought that was the sun. She wanted to go outside, so I just let her go. Time for a game of Will This Kill Brenton? Up first, here's a crack on the border of this fish tank. Where did it come from? Where will it go? Will it kill Brenton? And on the gravestone say, Cotton Eye Joe. Did he buy it like this? Is it just cosmetic? Is the tank going to explode any minute? Stay tuned for a thrilling conclusion in Brenton's Fish. Not this episode though, like eventually. Here are my first in-house tiger endlers, completely adapted to Pensacola water, bless their hearts. And that's always my favorite generation is uh, the first one, the most exciting. <laughs> You're my favorite. I think by the second or third generation, they all kind of like your water and they're all fully adapted. Um, so really the third generation should be my favorite because that's, those are the fish that choose me. Here is a special public service announcement. Sometimes when you're fighting algae, you will find videos that tell you to use hydrogen peroxide to get your algae off the moss. You need to be careful though, because these are not visual videos. And maybe the research should happen off of YouTube regardless. If you get the measurements wrong, the hydrogen peroxide will also kill the moss the same way it killed the algae. I'm really going to blame the other YouTube on that one though, because that video obviously wasn't intuitive enough. It did not guide me down the correct cow path. You would assume 
that the measurements would be inside the video if they were crucial. If they were not, maybe my eyes were closed. My moss suffered for it this day. Rest in peace, Peacock Moss, Taiwan Moss, or Willow Moss, whatever the hell you were. I apologize for deflecting blame. I'm in mourning. The pre-season planted water sump trash can cart on wheels that I use to take the edge off the tap water. I can do 90% water changes on tanks without the fish flinching. The blue trash can is for clean water incoming. The green is for outgoing. Basically a 32 gallon fish tank with no fish that allows me to cut through the nitrates that come through the tap water. Also buffs out those ammonia spikes. pH is stabilized. The temperature is stabilized. And it's a good cane to lean on. It helped me realize big box stores were selling me sick fish. Petland in particular will give you a warranty. They have their staff trained to gaslight you into thinking you killed the fish if you bring it in. Back in the beginning, Corey gave me the idea of putting a 32 gallon trash can on a set of wheels. That, he showed it for outgoing water. I like my can for incoming. Nonetheless, this water smells how it looks, like a babbling spring brook. When it first comes out of the tap, I can clearly smell the chlorine, but after 24 hours, it is sweet and serene. You'll catch me swimming in here if the power goes out and the temps hit 100. Aphids and all. My house plants do enjoy this water. I've got the Sansi light and I haven't decided whether it's helping or hurting me. Frogbit is looking a little tortured. These cheap Amazon Aqua Neat lights are loving the Frogbit. I haven't seen a light treat Frogbit this good. Seems a lot healthier than my other batch of frog bit. Hey, dog. I've got some floating shelves here. Actually screwed right into the drywall. I wanted the high society status of not needing check valves on the back of all my airlines. I'm always on the lookout for failures within the fish room. One of those failures that keep me up at night is when an air pump fails, the airline suctions. So that means when the power goes out, the air pump will stop blowing altogether. And these airlines turn into a little siphon hose in which the same effect that allows you to clean out your fish tank will actually empty out all of your fish water right onto your living room floor. Anytime I've miscalculated, my gang valves get water in them and then they just kind of drip out. I'd imagine if the tubing was connected directly to the air pump, that non-powered pump would get waterlogged and you would have a slip and slide right in your living room. These check valves are supposed to sit on the back of the tank, right above the water line, but with 21 tanks, it gets a little overwhelming. But one time early in the game, a sealant went out to an old tank that I was using. And what I was hearing was the hang on back filter creating a waterfall. This waterfall feature gave a very relaxing ambiance until I realized that there wasn't supposed to be a waterfall feature in my living room and I looked over and my fish tank was half empty. I can't really handle the noise and the commitment that comes with these piston air pumps. These large white pipes going through the walls. Seems like a lot of pre-planning has to go into this. You have to know exactly what you want and where you want it. And if you play it by ear, you'd probably make a giant rat nest mess. I'm not sure how loud it is. I'm constantly changing my mind, so I need something to live, breathe, and grow with me. Kind of like Trapper Keeper. Trapper Keeper, ready to insorb. Trapper Keeper, merging. Scalability is my main priority and it really has to be as big or as little as I need it in that moment. I use these uh, Tetra air pumps from Amazon. They're 16 to $20. They do the trick for me quiet enough. They have this squat position. It takes up so much space. It drives me bananas. These floating shelves were very affordable and I'm glad to see they're stable enough, even with just the uh, drywall anchors. Even with one fish tank, I think the single air pump sitting and waving out everyone, it's too gaudy and it might as well be a steam engine on top of the fish tank. The little check valve having the audacity to sit up there like an antenna. I never found a good way to hide it until now. Put it high, I'm probably going to cover it with plants. All the plants. These plants probably need to be drought tolerant, beginner friendly, indoor tolerant, low light, pet friendly. The air pumps do make the whole wall hum. Right now, it still feels like a novelty. I'm walking through my halls like I'm a, a monk in a fish temple. Walk through these arches. 
and you will arrive to Brenton's Fish. In the future, I want to find some dark brown foam for the air pumps to sit on top of. Muffle out some of this vibration. I do predict some cable management soon. It's always been something I'm a little apprehensive about because it doesn't seem like anything stays in the same place for more than nine months. There's maybe a little more longevity here when I'm placing these tanks. I could probably use clips and plastic ties, zip ties, Velcro ties. I use Velcro that's double-sided to pin these check valves. This turquoise color that Penplax uses, I swear, is from the year 1972. It looks like it's a commemoration template color for Jacques Gusteau, and I'm just really happy to see history in the fish room. I plan on keeping these above the waterline that they adjust to. If I have to switch out tanks, I can do that with minimal effort. I'm putting these upside down, and I'm keeping everything consistent in terms of left to right, one through five, or higher if I need it. I'm doing that on all these tanks. I'm waiting for all those odds and ends to come in the mail. Sometimes I don't realize I need it until I put it together and that piece is missing. If I waited until everything was 100% perfect, you guys probably wouldn't hear from me for about three months. So I figured I would just show you guys how the sausage is made instead of the entire kitchen going incognito. I originally wanted to have the check valves all up here and I would just adjust them in the same spot. But these fine sponges need constant adjustment and adjusting one without looking at it is one of the seven rings of hell. It was absolute clown work. It was comical how many times I had to reach up and then look back down for adjustment. It's impossible. I ended up sweaty. I got my cardio for the week. I was embarrassed. You really want to look at the air pressure in the eyes during adjustment. The upside of a fine mesh sponge is when you squeeze it, there's no tiny little baby shrimp in there. So I can clean them without pause. They do seize up more. It's a trade off from the looser grain sponge. But with that fine sponge, I'll just keep an eye on it and I will up the air on the spot to give myself a little more time before I have to go in there and clean out a clogged sponge. The Brazilian pennywort was doing terrible in this tank, so I put the Brazilian water weed in here instead. When I put the pennywort back here with the small amount of wood, it seems to be doing better with the same aqua neat light. Here are the carnivores. Not much change. I did get these out of the tubs. I do want to preface that this started out with me wanting to catch gnats. Now I think I have more gnats because I started keeping indoor plants. I would say it's worth it though because once I got my hand on these bog carnivorous plants, each one I get is like finding a little troll with a different colored gem in its belly. This yellow pitcher plant is native to the US. This is a common Venus flytrap from Lowe's and it is having a time. We've got some tiny little sundews in this pot that was just supposed to be a pitcher plant. Those are free sundews in there. Can you believe it? About a month in, I realized I needed pumice and vermiculite in the soil with these pingus. I'm going to switch out that soil soon. They actually started creating their dews, so I didn't think it was immediately necessary. The sundew has the head coming up. The biggest adjustment were for these guys. I think they need the most light. I put them out in the sun and they both look toasted. I'm just going to try to neglect them back to health. Let them sit here under this YesCom light. Number one plant killer is a board gardener. That's what I say. Double true for non-aquatic plants. The, the butterworts like to use this fertilizer. The carnivores all use Maxi. The mosquito bits keep the larva from having their fun, but I'm also trying this the fish keeper way and just throwing a water air pump in here. I'm assuming just a little bit of water will keep any mosquitoes from laying babies in here because those babies would sting me in my sleep. I'm trying to come up with an appropriate plan to let these go dormant for winter. I might as well start planning now and so that means in five months it might be cohesive enough to resemble effectiveness. A few days ago our daughter's pool filled with water. The frogs were yelling hard in the backyard. I knew that there was going to be a party and so here we are. A little frog army. I threw some algae wafers in there along with plants, mosquito bit, which takes away a food source from the frogs, I'm sure. 
Supposedly, they only eat mosquito larvae as a last resort, but if they don't have enough food in here, and they absolutely don't, they start eating each other, which I thought was uh, a little too metal for me. So I went ahead and threw Rapashi out here, algae wafers. You can tell the hyacinth is looking a little less zombified out here in the sun. And when I heard there was frogs out here, I had to throw some frog bit. One for the boys. I was hoping that the plants would be enough to cycle the water out here. You know, it gets oxygenated if it rains out here, but otherwise these tadpoles are coming up to breathe a little gulp of air every once in a while. I think it's hilarious that they're basically a little gelatinous bubble with legs one day. And the very next day, they're like half the size, but they're a full grown miniature version of an adult frog. I do currently have a plastic lid upside down in this pool so the froglets can get out. I hope this is actually the beginning of a slow boil to have this entire backyard covered in ponds. Big ponds, little ponds, deep ponds, shallow ponds, winter ponds, summer ponds. Really, I'm right against zone 8, so probably not going to be as useful as zone 9 or 10 during winter. This has been another episode of Brenton's Fish. We had some jokes. We had some tokes. I talked about air pumps entirely too long. Until next time, fish keepers. Until next time. Reach on down and touch it.